It was a final strive to produce a spark in hopes that that spark would ignite a dying flame. But after the accident four years ago, the tension in the atmosphere between myself and Karen was simply frozen. I mean, our relationship was beyond on thin ice. It had fully melted into a river of mindless blame and guilty regret. And she wanted a divorce. I mean, I didn't, but I guess I knew deep down that it was inevitable. In the winter of 2014, Karen and I had been together for six years. We'd been married for three and I have to say, our connection was on another level, beyond comprehension. Like we were on fire with electrically charged passion until our emotions met face to face with spontaneous combustion. February frost layered the midnight road as the full moon reflected glistening flickers of diamond surrounding the yellow cat eyes guiding our car home. We were coming back from Karen's brother's birthday party. We were only like three miles from the house. It was a Tuesday night. The road was completely void of any other signs of life. Empty, vacant, and inanimate until it suddenly lit up. I, I was driving. Karen was way too drunk to drive, and I shouldn't have been behind the wheel of that car either. And I knew that, but no one else at the party seemed sober enough to understand that. So I was admittedly way beyond my limit, and I take full responsibility for that. But I felt so pressured. My wife, her brother, even his wife, they, they all kept pushing me to drive. They kept saying things like, it's not that far. You'll be the only one on the road. Don't be a wimp. You know, it was hard. We should have just walked, but we didn't. I got behind the wheel of that car, and within one mile from our house, I destroyed everything that Karen and I ever had. But the darker side of the story would stain our entire lives forever till death do us part. Karen wanted to hear some music, but she was too drunk to work the car stereo. She was in full on blacked out party mode at this stage. I was trying to find a station for her when I noticed that she was taking off her clothes. She was looking at me licking her lips. I remember looking into her beautiful blue eyes and thinking about how hot she looked and BAM! We hit a young woman walking home from her next door neighbor's house. She died instantly. She was seven months pregnant. It took the ambulance a full hour to get to our location. It took the cops too. When the blues finally arrived and finished taking our statements, they breathalyzed me. But of course I was no longer over the legal limit at that stage. So the accident was attributed to Frost. A frost that chilled both Karen and I down to cracked shells of our former selves, worn out insoles of our souls. If that. We never forgave ourselves or each other for that matter, and we were never the same again. Why would we be? We were the worst kind of murderers, and we got away with it. We slept in our own beds that very night while the dead woman's husband identified the badly broken pregnant body of his wife. Come to think of it, we didn't do much sleeping. And I still don't. Four hard long years later, Karen served me with divorce papers. She had nothing left. I knew it. She told me that she was empty inside and that the only way we could possibly move on was to not be together. I didn't want her to go, pack her stuff, and, and move out, but she was doing the right thing. So she started putting her stuff into boxes. Her brother Stephen caught wind of this, and he wasn't happy. Apparently, Karen told his wife, Allison, about the divorce papers, and Allison had tried to talk Karen out of it. But Karen told Allison her mind was set. Stephen came straight over to the house with Allison and they begged us not to give up hope. Stephen broke down and told us how responsible he felt for everything that had happened that night in 2014. 
I tried to tell him that he was only prolonging our pain by trying to convince us to stay together. Karen agreed. Then Allison started crying and mumbling that it was all her fault. I told everyone very firmly that it was my fault and mine alone. I could have chosen not to drive that night, but I did. And that's that. When I said that, everyone stopped talking. There was an awkward silence echoing off the walls in the room for several moments while everyone realized the inevitable truth. It was over. Then a single heartbeat spoke. It was Stephen. He made us promise to go on one more camping trip before we part ways for good. <sighs> we used to go camping with them five or six times a year. You know, two couples, open air, beer, blazing fire, tents, all that kind of stuff. <sighs> to be honest, it, it was something I hadn't realized that I was going to miss, or something that I was already missing. I glanced across the room at Karen. She was already looking at me. I could see an ever so slight raise in her high cheekbones. The thought of a final camping trip pleased her. It was a spark. Two days later, we packed our bags and headed for the Freetown State Forest. Stephen drove. I hadn't driven a car since the accident. I sat up front in the passenger seat and you know what? The drive over to Massachusetts was unexpectedly alive and energetic. I mean, it was like magic. Karen's mood was in a state I hadn't seen it in since... since I could last remember. Her and Allison buzzed in the back seat while I controlled the music. For the first time in four years, I could touch a car stereo without flashbacks from the accident. And there was this playfulness between Karen and I. Not quite a fire, but a definite hope. It felt good. Karen had decided to bring one of our old photo albums along for the trip. Neither of us had looked at pictures in a long, long time. Hell, we hadn't taken a single picture together in four years. The day before we left, Karen told me that if there was a chance for us, even a single shred of light, she figured we'd find it in that photo album or in those woods. We arrived at Freetown State Forest at about 3.30 p.m. On the way in, just past the forest sign, something ran across the road, inches away from the car, causing Stephen to swerve and come to a full stop in the middle of the road. Now, I admittedly didn't get a good look at whatever it was, but I thought I saw an animal, like a deer or something, but I don't know, it, it was too fast and... Karen and Allison didn't see anything. Stephen swore it wasn't a deer. He said it had antlers, but he swears it was wearing a cloak and had a skull for a head or something. I assured him that it was just a deer and eventually he agreed and shrugged it off. I mean, it gave us all the shakes for a few minutes, but we all calmed down surprisingly quick considering, well, you know, 2014. Anyway, we parked the car and walked for about a mile to set up camp somewhere far away from other campers. When we got to our site, the ladies made a fire pit while Stephen and I set up the tents. And again, the mood was as sunny and bright as the September weather that surrounded the woods. For a moment, I thought the trip might actually be working. Three hours later, we had music from a wind-up radio. A campfire blazing, and the sun was setting beautifully under the tops of the trees surrounding our site. The four of us sat around the fire and conjured up memories that I had forgotten about. We laughed through the years of our past and fought off the tears of a future that we all silently feared would have a drastic effect on, well, all of us. As Stephen recalled a camping trip from years ago when we all encountered a bear that was fond of marshmallows, I looked over at Karen, only to find her gaze was already consuming my direction. She smiled under her brother's voice and continued to gaze at me through the dancing flame burning between us, igniting the spark that I was looking for. We still had a chance. After hours of reminiscing, several adult beverages, and a bit of admittedly tone-deaf singing, 
Stephen and Allison said goodnight to Karen and I before disappearing through the unzipped hatch in their tent. I winded up the radio to give it another charge and threw some more logs on the fire while Karen disappeared into our tent to get something. Moments later, Karen returned and silently sat down right next to me in front of the fire holding a massive black leather photo album. I knew this album very well. It had pictures in it from as far back as the first year Karen and I started dating, all the way up to our wedding and honeymoon. I could feel it. This was our redemption. Or at least it was supposed to be. Karen smiled into my eyes, leaned toward me, lightly pressed her warm lips against mine and kissed me for the first time in four heartbreaking years. It felt so good. But it was the last time that Karen would ever kiss me again. Karen placed the photo album in our laps and slowly opened it to the first page of photographs. So many memories came flooding back to me. Karen immediately began to tear up. We held each other for an hour and talked about every single photo in that album. One by one, until we got to the last photo. As Karen turned the final page in the album, there was one last full-page photograph of us on the left. We were in a car, driving somewhere, like a road trip or something. I don't remember, but what I do remember is that both of our faces were completely scratched off the photo. It took me a minute to realize it was us. To be honest, I, I recognized the car first. It was that car. Our murder weapon. Then our attention was drawn to the inside of the back cover of the album, the right side, across from the haunting photo of Karen and I. There was something written in red, fresh red liquid. I read it out loud. If you yourself cannot release, then it will come to take a piece. I asked Karen if she did this, if she destroyed the photo and wrote the message, but she swore that she didn't. I told her that it wasn't very funny and that I felt very hurt by this, but again, she promised me that she had nothing to do with what was in that album. She was about to say something else when a horrifying sound rang out through the midnight forest. We dropped the photo album as we sprang up to our feet like stray cats caught off guard. We could hear a ticking sound coming from somewhere around us like a clock or something. Karen shrieked in terror and grabbed onto me tightly. She was trembling. I quickly shut off the radio sitting to my left so I could listen. The ticking had stopped, but it was that first noise that had me shook up. I'd never heard anything like it in real life. It was monstrous, instantly hair-raising. Karen and I stood frozen in front of the fire with our eyes dancing all around the thick darkness that engulfed the forest. After a few moments of silence and no further creepy sounds, I told Karen that it was more than likely just an animal and that we probably shouldn't worry as most animals wouldn't come very close to an open fire. She was about to reply when we both saw it. A sight that will haunt me forever. Standing on the other side of the fire, sneering at us through the flames, was a terror that we could never have imagined. The first thing I noticed was... teeth. The bottom half of the creature's disfigured face was mostly made up of sharp, pointed teeth that lined the inside of its black, rotten, corroded gums or lips. I'm not sure which and its face was void of any facial expressions other than ghastly scars that covered its entire head. It had no eyes, no nose, no ears, no hair, just, just old, dirty skin with raw, open wounds that appeared to be in bad need of stitches. And that creepy thing was wearing a gray suit with a white button-up shirt. It just stood there silently smiling at us. We didn't know what to say or do or... We were shocked. We didn't even scream. I remember that the thing was wearing red cloth fingerless gloves. At the end of each finger was a long black claw. I started to ask it what it wanted, but the second I opened my mouth it started rounding the fire and walking toward Karen and I. 
We bolted towards Steven and Allison's tent in full-on sprint. As we got closer, Karen began screaming Steven's name and begging him to wake up. Neither him nor Allison answered. We got to the tent and Karen fumbled with the zipper, still crying out for her brother to wake up. I looked behind us. The creature was gone and the forest was silent. And then I heard the tent unzip and Karen scream in sheer anguish. I will never forget how long that scream echoed in the blackness of that dark forest. I snapped my head back towards Stephen and Allison's tent and saw what my wife saw. Stephen and Allison, or what was left of them. My brother-in-law and his wife were both missing one of their legs from the hip down. It also appeared that the leg bones that made up the limbs that they were missing had been used to impel their torsos. One of Allison's severed feet was crammed so far down Stephen's throat that his jaw had become unhinged. Allison suffered the same fate with one of Stephen's feet. They both appeared to have been folded in half backwards at the waist, and they were disemboweled. There was blood everywhere. Karen was screaming and delirious. Then suddenly that hideous sound rang out through the woods again. This time it was much closer than before. Karen and I were still facing Stephen and Allison's tent, too horrified to turn around. I looked at Karen. I was about to tell her to run when two red-gloved, fingerless, black-clawed hands grabbed both sides of her face and dragged her away into the darkness of the woods so fast that it was as if she was never there. <laughs> I spun around and shouted her name, but was met with nothing other than echoes of my own voice. I stumbled toward the dying campfire and called out for my wife again. No response. I was about six feet away from the fire pit when the beheaded body of Karen fell from somewhere up above me and landed in the fire. I instinctively turned around to make a run for it and ran directly into the creature. It had been standing behind me, quietly smiling. I fell on my back on the ground at the feet of the suited monster. As I shuffled away on the ground, I accidentally kicked our photo album halfway into the fire. When I did this, the creature before me hissed as though it was in pain. It fell to its knees and then began crawling toward me on all fours, snapping at my feet as it got closer. I kicked the photo album further into the campfire, enraging the creature into a frenzy of fury. It jumped up on its bent knees with its fist on the ground and prepared to pounce like a cat. It all happened so quick, but I recall it in haunting slow motion. I remember the creature's body leaving the ground and launching toward me with an open mouth intent on doing damage to my flesh. I remember thinking, this is my final moment. Then out of nowhere, accompanied by that dreadful sound we'd heard earlier, Something clashed with the suited creature mid-air and took it to the ground. The two things landed hard on the forest floor with a heavy thud as they tumbled over each other. I climbed up to my feet and ran as fast as I could through the forest and away from the campsite. I stumbled through the dark forest for what seemed like hours. I had no shoes, no water, and adrenaline had consumed most of my energy. There were thorns and other things all over my body, but... I could only feel one thing, exhausted. I finally found a blacktop road and collapsed the second I got on top of it. And then everything went black. I woke up in a hospital, handcuffed to my bed. The police came into my room and questioned me. And I told them everything, the entire uncut truth. And they didn't believe me. I could tell straight away. They asked me to describe the other thing that saved me, but all I could remember was that it had antlers like a deer, and it made a terrible sound. I was arrested that night, and later on I was convicted of the first-degree murder of my wife, Stephen, and Allison. I was sentenced to death by a jury of my peers, and now I'm just waiting. But something tells me that I may not make it that far. That 
My time is up. Watch new scary vids every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday.